Am I responding? I am responding to you are so quickly deserting the one who has called you to live in the grace of Christ and turn to a different gospel, which is no really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to convert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or another angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Okay, we're going to make some quick notes. The tongues need to be ones to preach of the gospel. What are you saying? Life and death of Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? What is the truth of the gospel? Okay. What if someone say something? Um, yes, you can turn on God and see the sign of the cross. Um, yeah. Yeah. What else you go on this? What is the truth of the gospel? What's the point of the cross? Gloria, what would you say? What's the point of the cross? Yeah. Anything else that's important? What do you reckon? start with that <clears throat> you could probably go more and more detail well who were the galatians what is the book about so galatians is yeah all struggles blah blah through here through here and then you can go to a couple times and so he is now we are concluding that after his next galatians is come back to driving the letter back to the church um, Galatia is not a city, but it's a like group of cities. Everything in this area yeah, is what we're talking about. Um, we reckon it's quite an early book, about 48 to 49 AD. Um, fits with the story of Acts. It all scholars assume it really was Paul, it might argue or anything. Um, we can read in the book of Acts what happened. Iconium, Lystra, and Derby are the cities that we're talking about. Very briefly, what happened in each of those cities, there's a couple of healings. Um, and then persecution. They tried to offer sacrifices to them after they healed someone. Uh, and they said, no, you've got them wrong. Um, but he planted churches in each of these cities. And then he gets um, and moved on because of the persecution. And now he's writing back to them. Uh, it's very interesting. Let's look at the first couple of verses. Um, Helen, if you could find 11 to 12, and Dory, if I see four. And George, you find two, 11 to 13. I'll go mine. What did you always make the start of the Thanksgiving? We have a greeting. What else do we have? Thanksgiving. What else do we have? A prayer. Okay, let's have a look at Galatians. Yeah. Right. Galatians 1 says, Paul and Apostles sent. Not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins and to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God the Father, 
Yeah. 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 First thing, why am I astonished? You must say quickly tell them why. Now, the first thing we notice is there's no thanksgiving and there's no prayer. Um, this tells us that he's quite urgent um, and he hasn't really even thought about doing it properly because he's really, really urgent and powerful to write what he's writing. Because something's going on that he's very upset about. And he just wants to get to the point. So he didn't doesn't do the normal flowery introduction. He's skipped all that to get straight to the point. Okay, 11 to 12, what have you got? Helen? Yes, now this is very interesting. Rest, for the rest of chapter one, we get a bit of history of how Paul got his gospel. And his point is that he didn't get told this by someone else, but direct encounter with God, direct revelation from God. Is where he's got his gospel. So he's not passing on second hand things. He's giving you first hand revelation that comes direct from God. Um, two, four. Gloria. Yeah. Now. Okay. Okay, there's that truth of the gospel phrase. So we want to just pause for that because that might be interesting. What does Paul mean? He said about if people infiltrated our ranks to spy on our freedom, what is freedom? What do we what does Paul mean by freedom? From more from more. Yeah. Okay, very good. So he's talking about um the freedom and that has come from, yes, the Old Testament laws and requirements and things like that. That was his main point. Okay, 2 11 to 13. Is that you, George? Yeah. yeah. And go to 14. When Peter came to Antioch, I told you that you should not be ignorant of what happened to you in the world. And when certain men came from him, he used to meet the Gentiles. When they arrived, he began to go back to separate. The other Jews joined in the hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was directed to the But I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter, in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you look like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it? Then, that you force Gentiles to follow Jews. Mm, so, there's truth in the gospel again. Um, so, we can see the problem. Some people from Jerusalem have come down, and from James, the brother of Jesus in the Jerusalem church. And before that, he was hanging out with the Gentiles, and the church was just doing their thing, and they would eat together and fellowship together. But when these other circumcised Jewish people came, suddenly he got all awkward and embarrassed and peer pressure. And so he no longer ate with the Jews and he's now separating himself to become like the other Jews again. And he just did, Paul says, you're not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. So what particular truth of the gospel was he thinking that Peter had abandoned and he lost? He lost freedom um, and and to pick it up from what he said, that the unity of the gospel, that all are one, right? Jew and Gentile, no division, no barrier. All people are brought together as one because one salvation, one grace, one baptism, all that sort of thing. You're now separating out and requiring people, if they want to be friends with you, they have to do what your Jewish customs and things are. That's why he says, well, and then calls it hypocrisy. Up and when there's no Jews here, you'll just hang out with the Gentiles and stuff, and now you're putting on another show again. So, yeah, that's a, a key verse probably for understanding the book. Um, chapter three, one to five, another key section of the book. <clears throat> you foolish Galatians, the whole thing is an argument about this. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the 
the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you really experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain, I ask you again, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? So we have this whole argument developing that you've got a choice between faith or law. And his evidence is that this coming of the spirit has validated your relationship with God. And that is what it's all about because that's what he's pointing to. He said, when you received the Holy Spirit before you did any of this more stuff, why are you now trying to add all that back in when you've already had Holy Spirit, you've already had miracles, which came just simply from faith. And so we'll go through this big thing. We have in 3, 10 to 14, a big discussion about the differences between law, the choices, law and faith. So I think I'm going to write. Of here, let's make a list of the law on one side and there's also box on this side. And list the attributes of both as I go through, call out some things I should write under one column or the other. For all who rely on the works of the law or under a curse. Curse, let's write that down. If you're living by law, you curse. Curse. As it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Um, important in that phrase is everything. Okay. <clears throat> Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before, before God because the righteous will live by faith. That's a quote. On another one, let's put faith on this side. Let's put faith on this side. Faith is the word. The law is not faith on faith on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. And you have to do everything. And you have to do to God, and no one does everything, so therefore they're under a curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a pole. Let's put a cross here. Let's put a cross here. Okay, he redeemed us in order the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. What is the blessing promised to Abraham that has now come to the Gentiles? Yes, you'll be all nations will be blessed through you. All of that stuff that promises to Abraham, Paul says, now comes to the Gentiles um, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Another section that helps us to understand this more about this whole, he goes through more about law and blah, blah. He goes through about 3, 24 to 25. Nice summary passage. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Um, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. What he's talking about is a young person who was not um, able to receive their inheritance, okay, until they came of age. So they'd be appointed if you your parents had died and you, you you're six years old, you can't get the inheritance that all the property of your father until you reach the age of your adult. So there would be a guardian like a trustee that is supervising your estate until you are, have grown to be an adult and then it will be passed over to you. That's the guardian. And what he's saying is uh, we had a guardian of the law that was supervising us until we were ready to receive our full promise. And our full inheritance, we weren't ready to receive it. But now the spirit has come. Well, we don't need the guardian of the law anymore. We've grown up and we're able to accept the inheritance ourselves. Um, moving on a bit further into chapter four, we find out what he's talking about. Formerly, verse eight, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Right. 
But now you know God, or rather you are known by God. How is it you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. Oh, now we get some on what he's talking about. Days and months and seasons and years. These are weak and miserable forces that enslave people. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. <clears throat> do we do special seasons, days, and months, and years? What do we do? Christmas. Okay. What else do we do? Christmas, Easter. What do you say? Anzac Day. Okay. That's not really part of our Christmas calendar, but okay. Um, but certainly, are we enslaving ourselves by celebrating Christmas and Easter? According to the book of Galatians, we don't, and that's probably the key. We don't tell people that this is essential, as it goes officially, to your relationship with God. Right? It's just, where did you turn up for church on at Christmas Day or not? You're not going to go to hell because you didn't come to church on Christmas Day, right? You didn't. If you if you have a Christmas tree, is that going to feed you to hell? If you don't have a Christmas tree, is that going to feed you to hell, right? Is that going to cut off your relationship with God? Where do you need Easter or not? It's not going to cut off your relationship with God. So we do have these special days that we have are reminders for us, so we don't forget. All right? They're not essential elements to maintaining our relationship with God, and that's what he was saying. They were essential elements. You have to have certain days and seasons out. Traditional churches have a whole calendar, right? They celebrate for different periods and different days and things. Um, but as long as they remind us for us of the truth of the message that we preach and not requirements for salvation, I know in some sections of some denominations, if you don't turn up on a certain day and do a certain thing, well, God is not going to welcome you. And God is not going to accept you. And that is this. Special days and months and seasons. If you don't perform certain things for certain days and times of the year, then um, God is no longer pleased with you. That's what He was talking about, and that's not what we want to have. What else? Looking at Galatians, what else is in here that we need to know? The truth. That's Galatians chapter five. That's what is the truth of the gospel. This freedom that we were talking about is for freedom. Then that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I tell you, if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ is a no value at all. That's pretty powerful. You say you basically um, ended your relationship with Jesus. If you do that, you have who are trying to be justified by the law, been alienated from Christ, and fallen away from grace. But through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. In Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I'm going to put that on this slide. The problem with this gospel versus this gospel, what's the problem that people worry about when they see this gospel instead of this gospel? When they see, hmm? do what you like. So this is where chapter five he starts to address that. He starts to talk about you were running a good only thing because he's just said the only thing that matters is just love everybody, right? Because they're faith in God, and you can see people going, but hold on a minute, that's like anything goes. Da, 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 da. And he talks about that, blah blah blah, and then he says in verse thirteen, "You, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but." Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another. Serve one another in love. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We've got flesh on this side. And spirit on that side, you can see how important spirit becomes in the opposite to law. Law, flesh, 
spirit is very important in it because the opposite is you're either walking under law, serving the flesh, or you're walking in the spirit. Um, and if you're walking, in, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Walk by the spirit. 17. The flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. The spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, and there's a big list you know, immorality, impurity, witchcraft, idolatry, anger, selfish ambition, drunkenness, blah, blah, blah. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is, you know, spirit, love. Faithfulness and self control. If you've got that list, there's no law that can stand up against that list. Against such things, there's a law. There's no law that comes close to producing that sort of thing. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. So let us live in the spirit and keep in step with the spirit. The whole point is live by the spirit. When you live by the spirit and you're trusting Jesus for your righteousness, you will lovingly serve one another. And that will, and that will keep you away, a long way away from that, and a long way away from the things people are worried about, about people. It's not just your freedom that Jesus gives you is not just to please yourself, but it is enabling you to serve others in love. And if that's our understanding, that keeps us free from the self-centered grace gospel where I just do what I like and say when well, I'm free from the law. <clears throat> The gospel of freedom would be receive the spirit by faith so you can serve others in love. That's the freedom that God is calling us to. Um, you can, yes, enslave slavery to the law, slavery to sin, and live in the flesh world, or you can walk by faith and grace into the spirit. Um, and this is the main thing. Um, do we have this problem today of law versus grace? Do we see that in our churches very often? Hmm? We still, still do? Have you? Not, we don't have Jewish laws. How, how, can, how often do you run across that? Do you come across it? Like, what would be an example? I, I, don't, so I don't think we have this problem really. Pentecostal churches don't really most people not it's not really our thing yeah that's not really our issue um, yes yep so so there are we do have some yes yes there are some but generally speaking um our area of churches. We don't really have that. Our, we are probably we have the problem and we don't have this. This is probably what they're lacking. Right? We've understood that we don't have law, but we don't really necessarily enable people how do you live by the spirit. Um, we're free from the law and Jesus has forgiven us. The purpose of that is so that you can receive the spirit and serve one another in love. That's the um so we've stopped that forgiven. And for God to receive the Spirit, live by the Spirit, serve one another in love. And so that's probably how we, the most, I reckon the most important thing you can teach anyone is how to tune into the Holy Spirit and so they can love and serve people. If people are doing that, then there's, they don't, we don't have to worry about them abusing their forgiveness and coming back to, I'll just be forgiven and sin and get forgiven and sin because I'm so busy loving and serving by the Spirit that I'm, Going in the opposite direction anyway. And that's probably if we can mentor people into receiving the spirit and lovingly serving, we've um we're on the totally on the right track. And because it's such a positive, forward-looking thing rather than a don't go, don't go. It's a come on, hear from God, come on, love someone, come on, serve someone, bless someone. It's a totally different um attitude and very powerful if we can get that kind of these people. Okay, we will stop at 10:59. Let us remember when we are preaching and sharing the gospel. Let's share this. Um, I've never really, I, I'm thinking about my non Christians I'm talking to and stuff. 
do we tell them that they can just take the spirit and that would change their life? Um, okay, Jesus will forgive your sins, but yet to do the state of spirit, oh, wow, the life will become different. That's something that's totally off our radar. But that was the thing that they were proclaiming. You come on, come to Jesus, you'll receive the spirit, and everything will be different. Um, yes, okay, we'll stop right there.